Hello, my name is Nate Richardson. I have a presentation for you on four excuses people use to claim that the second coming of Jesus Christ is distant. We're going to go over those, talk about why that's not the case. All right, number one is the world is not bad enough yet. Number two, the Lord's people aren't ready yet. Number three, much prophecy needs to be fulfilled before he comes. Stuff like wars, gatherings, meetings, and stuff. Number four, past prophets thought it was soon, but we're still waiting. Okay, so let's talk about each of these. Number one, the world is not bad enough yet. Okay, and also let's say from no, more about uh, comments on the timing of the second coming. Okay, we um, no one knows exactly. Okay, right? That's that's what, how you always have to start these conversations. No one knows exactly. Joseph Smith said there are false prophets if they say they know exactly. Um, but we are the children of light. Heavenly Father said that. Uh, he would come, the Lord would come as a thief in the night, but there are the children of night of light who would not be deceived. It's right there in the scripture. So, uh, it's a righteous thing to look for the signs and to get a general idea of what's going on. And uh, the scriptures also use analogies like a pregnant woman. Okay, you know it's about time. Okay, or a, uh, you know it's about time. Or the uh, uh, tree leaves. Okay, here come the leaves, there come the fruit, and so forth. Um, but I do have a document on the uh, quotes about... The, what the prophets have said about the timing and so forth and how it's particularly shortly after the seventh seal. We'll talk a little bit about that in this presentation. But So I also have um, my two favorite compositions on it are the document on the timing of the second coming, which is just the quotes from the prophets, giving us some ideas and on the general scriptural format of how this works. And then another one that's uh, events preceding the second coming, which is what the prophets have said about stuff that uh, happens before it that we that help, that's helpful as well. So... Rest assured, I do not bother you with intricate timelines and predictions, just quotes from the prophets about temporal meanings of scriptural seals, etc. No one knows the, when the coming will be exactly, I'm not going, uh, but I'm not going to be taken by surprise. It'll be any time now. Okay? So, um, before we get into the four reasons, we need to consider a few scriptures. Uh, so, Luke chapter 2, 45 to 48 says, but, but, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. Then shall he begin to beat the maidservants and the maidservants, and to eat and drink and be drunken. For the Lord of the very servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will call him in sunder, and will appoint him in his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, which prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit many worthy things worthy of stripes, he shall be beaten with few stripes. For whos unto whosoever is much is given, of him much is required. And to whom men have committed much of him they will ask more close quote from luke and uh, that doesn't mean of course from the savior quoted in luke doesn't mean i've heard people say oh i don't want to read that book or, or investigate that because if i know more about it i'll be more accountable well if you knew that there was the resource to learn more about it and you rejected it that's basically the same thing right okay don't play games just learn what you need to learn and deal with it that's the best way don't hide from god okay You'll be happier that way. So, uh, so notice that passage. The people, if, they, if you find yourself saying, my Lord delayeth his coming, say the second coming is not really going to be soon, then you're going to be getting into sloppy lifestyles and things that are not acceptable before the Lord, as this scripture shows, okay? All right, so also there are, I have in the document here on Richardson Studies, um, okay, briefly considered, DNC 4539, it says, He who fears for the Lord will look for the signs of his coming. DNC 3923 says, Look for the signs of the Lord's coming. DNC 5618 says, Pure in heart, uh, the poor who are pure in heart, uh, look to see the Lord's coming. Um, DNC 6138 says, The sun comes in an hour you think not. DNC 112, and then a plethora of other references, says, The timing is nigh at hand. The coming is nigh at hand. And, the, and it's quickly. Uh, the Lord cometh suddenly to his temple, as DNC 36 8, and no man knows the hour and the day of his coming, DNC 39 21, and a plethora of others, including Matthew 24 36. So let's, let's get on now. Let's talk about the first thing. The world is not bad enough yet, okay? Often I hear people who don't believe the second coming of Christ is uh, near. The reason they usually give me for this belief is the belief that the world isn't bad enough yet. They say something like, well, things are bad, but not nearly bad enough. There is much evil to be wrought before Jesus Christ's return. I suggest that one of the grand deceptions of the devil is that 
He desensitizes us to evil so we don't even realize it's all around us. I mean, look at what we accepted in the 50s versus what we accept as normal now. Look at how Elvis Presley is a normal dude now. And back then with the gyrations and the and the very lewdness and the the posing as a Christian, but not at all. Look at his personal life for five minutes. And anyway, it, there's so much that's... Um, okay, uh, not just his personal life. That guy was straight up into evil things. He, he was studied sex magic and, you know, Lester Crowley type stuff. So, anyway. Okay, so remember Alexander Pope's poem, Vice is a monster so frightful and mean as to be hated needs but to be seen, yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. Um, th and then I have a link to an address from Marky Peter, Elder Marky Peterson, given in the 70s, called Warnings from the Past, where he says the world was evil enough back then, for decades now, for basically half a century now the prophets of saying we're fully ripe and we're just as bad and worse as sodom and gomorrah and don't hold your breath is basically what they've been saying now they've also been saying not to make crazy preparations they say make preparations and righteous preparations are not crazy ones okay which is fair enough uh the, no matter how much we prepare there's got to be an element of trust in god we're not going to be able to be ready for this crap this Wonderful event, which will be wonderful to some and not to others. This event, okay, Boyd K. Packer of the same uh, of the twelve former of the twelve apostles said in two thousand eight is an address in his address titled Lehi's Dream and You, where he speaks of entertainment standards, etc. He says that uh, there's more evil in the world than has ever been known before. So that obviously means more evil right now than Sodom and Gomorrah or any other typical Babylonian prototype state of evil that was destroyed by God. Um, also in that address, Lehi's Dream and You, he says that because of largely because of television, the fate of our generation is that we live inside the great and spacious building. Whoa! That's, uh... That doesn't stir you nothing well. Okay. Get in the zone to where you'll be stirred by the words of the prophets. Are you desensitized to the prophets' words? Do these things mean... Do these things matter to you? You can, you can find ways of sensitizing yourself again. Okay. All right. If that's the case. Now, Ezra F. Benson, he also, in an address titled Satan's Thrust in December 1971, he gave this specific warning against rock music and the myriad of other evils among us today in which is considered normal. So, look at that, and he talks about uh, how that, that we, a lot of us see as normal and fun, and yeah, sure, it's fun, and it sounds great, but... Okay. That's a... Uh, Look into that one for sure. The, um, there are scores of other talks, given long ago and recently, that show the idea that the world isn't bad enough yet is true. Okay? Remember the scripture that says, when the Lord comes, it will be business as usual in Babylon. Things won't be so bad that people won't be going about their daily routines. Truly among the wicked, the Lord's coming, the coming of the Lord will be as a thief in the night, far from their expectation. And remember in Third Nephi, which is the prototype of what it's going to be like when Jesus returns in our day, um, Jesus came, you know, things were pretty well business as usual, you know, and then boom, everything caught on fire, right? The cities were suddenly sinking into the ground and being crumbled by earthquakes and going up in flames and, and Jesus comes to his temple, which actually it might have been a year, I think it was a year between when all those fires and things and destructions happened between his actual appearing, if you look closely at the text. I remember studying that in a seminary in an institute class. Um so, I mean, if you're waiting around for, like, really bad things to happen to start preparing, well, uh, who's to say that there's going to be some 20-year gap between when really bad things happen and when Jesus comes? Also, um, yeah, Neely Maxwell said, the life we're living right now, the society we're living in is a horror, is a horror house. Um, a horror house, too. But horror house, um... Of course, you've got your cars that have been branded as the traveling, the uh, prostitute houses on wheels. Um, so much evil is expedited that, uh, by by cars and everything else, of course, and the unbridled use of of media and the internet and uh, the the cell phone is really like a Urim and Thummim. Okay, it really is. So you've got a cell phone and it it shines light. Okay, remember Joseph Smith did? They asked, why did Joseph Smith wear a hat when he have a hat when he translated and stuff? 
It's to block the light, okay? So you can see the screen better. It's like if you're looking at your phone and it's bright outside, you kind of shade it, cover it so you can see what it says, okay? Same thing. And um, the Urim Thummim, uh, so I'm not saying the cell phone is the Urim Thummim, and I think there's greater things to come, obviously. There's things beyond our expectation. But you can use the cell phone to learn great things, which leads to your salvation, because no man can be saved in ignorance, said Joseph Smith. Or you can learn your, use your phone to consume upon your lusts, okay? So, let's go on here. Now, let's look at reason number two. Of course, so much more could be said about these, and this is just a short little exposition, okay? The number two that people use, the excuse people use, is the Lord's people aren't ready yet, okay? The fact is, is the second coming is at a set time. It's not dependent on whether we're ready. Perhaps something like the meeting at Adam on Diamond or the building of the New Jerusalem in you know, Missouri and some of the great things of Jesus coming to visit with the saints there and coming over for dinner. Welcome to dinner, Jesus. It's nice to see you today. Of course, we'll be more respectful than that, but he, the point is, is that he'll be living among the saints in the New Jerusalem. He'll walk the streets there. That is in the prophecies, okay? And that's everything from the beginning of scriptural record. We know that when there's the city of holiness, that the Lord goes there. So, All right, so the, the second coming is at a set point in time. The actual, the, the great millennium, okay? That is a set point in time. There's the, that's the whole point. We are being tested. Ellen McConkie also taught that the timing is set just as the birth of Christ was. And when the appointed time has come, the Lord will come regardless of everything and everyone. Remember also Nephi's prophecy that through church members would, uh, that though church members would be all around the world, their numbers would be few. Okay, if you're looking for the world in mass to convert to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ before the second coming, then you're waiting for something that I don't think will ever be. Now, after the millennium, there could be some serious changes in the number of the membership of the church. I very strongly believe there will. The millennium is a time of missionary work. We should not think that everyone in the church is going to suddenly become righteous before the coming of the Lord. The parable of the ten virgins which, according to President Kimball and Elder Holland, uh, this parable of the ten virgins applies to church members, members of the restored church. According to this parable of the ten virgins, only half will be ready at the time of the coming of the Lord. And interestingly enough, only about half of the members are active, okay, that come to church on a regular basis and are doing the basic things that are expected. Uh... There have been several sifting events in the church um, recently, such as its outspoken statements on controversial social issues like abortion, homosexual marriage, the need for marriage, and childbearing within marriage, and uh, a lot of things, um, if you pay close enough attention. The prophets have also spoken of a divide, that are, many are holding the, to the promises, and others are falling away for secu with secular ideas. It's hard, it isn't hard to see that many are choosing to better themselves and others are choosing to drift. So let's go on to the next reason why people say it's this, the second coming of Christ is distant. They say much prophecy needs to be fulfilled, okay? Because there's gathering, wars, meetings, and stuff. Okay, well, we're already seeing lots of wars and stuff. Um, those familiar with the prophecy uh, prophecies know that the signs are upon us. Many of us are guilty of not having studied the signs of the times. Dr. Thomas 45, 39 says, He who fears the Lord will look for the signs of his coming. And DNC 39, 23 and 61, 38 say, Look for the signs of Jesus, of the Lord's coming. And DNC 56, 18, poor who are, The poor who are pure in heart seek the Lord's coming. Okay, um, we are we guilty of being unfamiliar with the signs? Okay, when you're more familiar with the scriptural prophecies of them, it's easier to see when they've come to pass. Um, Legrand Richard's book, Marvelous Work and a Wonder, this apostle points out brilliantly how a lot of things are fulfilled that maybe you wouldn't think were. Um, he shows that uh, much of what we look forward to in a future day has already occurred, already occurring, or already occurring. The Lamanites to blossom, the wilderness, uh, in the, the wilderness to be as the road. Uh, um, 
rose, and uh, the kings to be carried on the shoulders, the gathering, the Isaiah description of the last days, the evil foreseen, and much more has occurred and is occurring. Okay, um, There's two types of limits that we're tempted to make, and two types of limits that we shouldn't make, which are the same ones. One is saying, oh, it'll ha the coming will happen this year or something. The other thing bad to uh, bad to do is to say it won't happen until this year. Okay, both of those are bad. Uh, it could be soon. Okay. Now, uh, you'll want to review events preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ to see more of the citations from the prophets on that topic at Richardson Studies. And uh, let's see. Also, I suggest Prophecy Key to the Future by Dwayne S. Crowther. He cites a lot of the pre presidents of the church and the and the apostles in the uh, about the signs of the times. And I have a summary of that on Richardson Studies, which I guess you could call it a summary. It's basically I've highlighted some of the key um, statements from the presidents and put summaries of those and the page numbers they're found on and so forth. Very useful. Okay. Regardless of things that may still need to occur, we have been counseled to not rely on intricate timelines and detailed numerical calculations on the timing of the coming of the Lord. The events of the scriptures, which which still need to be fulfilled, could happen very quickly. It's, it's very unwise to say it will be at least X number of years before he comes. Because people like to say, oh, the three and a half here and the three and a half years there and this, uh, this length of this war hasn't happened and all this, but that's dangerous. Dangerous to do. There could be multiple interpretations of those things. There could be some of them already fulfilled or fulfilling or there could be you know, an inability to prepare once those things set in place and so forth. Um, okay, I will briefly say that a basic that a basic research on the ga gathering of the Jews to Jerusalem uh, shows that it's already by and by and large fulfilled. Okay, uh, from when they became the state in something like 1946, uh, state of Israel again and so forth. I will say that the gospel goes to all the world via the internet and the missionaries. Uh, I will say that not everyone needs to hear the gospel before the millennium. The millennium will be a time of great missionary work. I will say that also there are many who abide the day of his coming who are not members of the church of Jesus Christ or even claim to be Christians at all. We know people of various faiths who are of great heart and will not be wiped out at his coming. Uh, for this, I have a few quotes compiled uh, in a document of uh, who won't abide the day of his coming. It's, you know, the Book of Mormon it says the more wicked part of the people were slain. Okay. So we're not, um, we're not a doomsday people. We don't say that only, God is only going to save a few of his children. Remember the Joseph Smith movie starts out and his dad says, well, Joseph, I don't believe God only, God intends to only save a few of his children. Um, of course, the greater you prepare, the greater, uh, your blessings will be in your, the ex more exponential your progress. Um, and it's certainly not something to take lightly, uh, you need to make be in as good as as good as standing with the Lord as possible, and not to take any chances with your soul. Of course, there's also a document that I very much enjoyed, one of the best on the topic, uh, Joseph Fielding McConkie's Scriptural Search for the Ten Tribes and Other Things We Lost. It shows that the ideas of a strange gathering of lost tribes from a space or a cave or some secret place isn't supported by Scripture. He shows as do the prophets, that the tribes are scattered throughout the earth, and we are currently gathering them. Well, has President Nelson said that the gathering of Israel taking place presently is the most important event taking place on earth at this time, in his devotional uh, for youth, a call to enlist and gather Israel. I believe that was 2000. Yeah, I think it was since he became the president in, in 2018, is when it came, I think. But uh, he, there's also an unprecedented amount of um, discussion from the prophets about the coming being near. There's frequent references in general conference of in the, the prayers spoken and the sermons that, that now is the time we're preparing for the millennium. We're preparing others. Uh, our mission now is to prepare others to live in the millennium. Some people come out and say, hey, I've got this patriarchal blessing that says uh, I'll be alive in it or my kids will when the coming happens. But I think that that's been discouraged to say such things in patriarchal blessings. I'm not going to go against patriarchal blessings, but I'm just going to say uh, we, we uh, 
And I personally believe it's going to be just a decade or two tops. I mean, but um, all I'm saying is there's the caution is out there among about uh, about uh, making estimations on a large scale and such. But uh, it's very reasonable that um, I mean I, I'll try, I try to avoid when I talk about this kind of thing. I try to avoid statements that I didn't. Hear, hear one of the brethren say myself or have a reference for it, so I'll, I'll spare you some of the speculative things that I've heard that are going on right now, but anyway, it's definitely a time to be excited. Um, let's go on to part four, which people claim past prophets thought it was soon, but we're still waiting, okay? A careful study of the prophecies and attitudes of Latter-day prophets shows a theme of excited waiting for the eminent coming of the Lord. Seeming discrepancies fall away as one looks at the circumstances around statements regarding the timing of the Lord's coming. For example, a statement to Joseph Smith that the Lord would come by about the time Joseph was 80 or something, if Joseph lived that long. Well, Joseph didn't live that long, and um, all that could have been referring to the Lord's coming at the New Jerusalem with his people, which would be a private coming, rather than referring to the grand coming to the whole world, which is at a set time, as before mentioned. Also consider that the day of the Lord can have several meanings, such as a momentous time when great events will take place for the people of the Lord, rather than always applying to the grand beginning of the millennium, when Christ is seen by all coming in the clouds from the east. There are also statements of presidents from the church that, of the church which suggest an opinion that the coming will happen by a certain year, such as this, uh, from President Joseph Fielding Smith which he said in April of 1936, and which is cited in the Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 3, page 2 to 3, and the Doctrine and Covenants Institute Manual, page 61. So things that make it into the church official institute manuals. Um, I don't know if it's still there. It might have been an older version, but uh, those are super rock solid. Now... Okay, so this is what Joseph Fielding Smith said. Quote, The day of the coming of the Lord is near. I do not know when. I sincerely believe it will be. It will come in the very day when some of us who are here today, again, this is 1936, will be living upon the face of the earth. Close quote. Okay, note also that he states, not that this is a prophecy, but it's his personal belief. And, well, it's good stuff. Joseph Smith and others have repeatedly taught that no one knows the exact time of Christ's coming. Uh, okay. Um, but he also taught, Joseph Smith also taught that, uh, when Christ said no one knows the time of his coming, that was referring to people then living, and that at the time near the coming, that, that day that, uh, the Lord would reveal it to his prophet. He used Amos 3.7 to prove this, uh, that everything God does will be made known to his prophet. See, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, compiled by Joseph Fielding Smith. To, for, for that and and of course Joseph said that God will what God will make known to the to the present he'll make known to any saint all right so um, in my document five quotes from the ensign and living prophets which show the second coming will occur shortly after 2000 AD in this document I have these five quotes obviously um, I show the consistent teaching from ancient to modern scripture as seen in official church manuals and publications that the meaning of the seals in the book of Revelation have been clarified by the prophets and that the time of the coming of the Lord is indeed upon us in the near, very near future. Okay, do you know what the seals mean in the book of Revelation? Is it speculation? Do we have to guess? Well, the manuals, the scripture manuals from the church say otherwise. Basically, uh, the Bible Dictionary says Adam lived 4,000 B.C., and that means 6,000 years have passed. Okay, 4,000 B.C. to now. Okay, obviously 4,000 years occur, transpire to the birth of Christ. 2,000 years have generally um, essentially passed from the birth of Christ to now. 4 plus 2 is 6,000. Um, the DNC teaches that the temporal life of Earth is 7,000 years, each thousand being like a day, and the last day being the 1,000-year millennium. And remember, uh, when Adam ate the Adam and Eve ate the fruit, he told them, if, "If you eat the fruit, you'll die in the day you eat thereof." And remember, did they die in the day they ate thereof? Yes, because a day to God is a thousand years. 
No one has ever lived on this earth more than a thousand years. Adam got pretty close. So did a couple of others, you know, the 900s. But in the day you ate thereof, okay, the day to man, the day to God is a thousand years to man. Um, this could apply to what was the creation of the earth, the seven day creation. I don't see any problem with that. Uh, especially when you get into all the potential errors in carbon dating and a lot of the sketch research on the that side of things. But, you know, if it's an old earth, I'm okay with that too. I don't have the answer. Uh, the church hasn't... There's definitely been a lot of opinions about this in the church. Most... Uh, anyway, Brigham Young said and others that we don't have a problem with it being an old earth. But... Uh, What's, what's relevant here is the Doctrine and Covenants says that the temporal lifespan of Earth is seven years, okay? So, any way you look at it, okay, it's 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 7,000 years, okay? So, 6,000 has passed, we know that, okay? So, 1,000 more, and what's the 1,000? Okay, the seven days, it's like a week. It's Monday through Sunday, each day, okay? These seven days, the seventh is the Sabbath day, which is the millennium, okay? It's a thousand years of peace, it's a great time of spiritual progress, uh, the presence of the Lord and so forth. Uh, great missionary work. The book of Revelation speaks of seals. Uh, the Lord clarified the meaning of those seals to be representative of these seven 1,000 year day periods of earth. Many ask why, based on these doctrines, didn't the second coming happen at year 2000 AD to start the last day of earth, which would be the opening of the seventh seal? Okay. Do you have that question? Um since there's the days and the 6,000 and the 7,000, the last seven, the one thousand year millennia, why <sighs> didn't Christ come already? Okay. So the answer is straight in the Doctrine and Covenants. Verse 7, chapter 70, section 77, verse 12. Quote, uh, okay. Uh, it gives the answer to that question, showing that there is, a, there is a little season after the opening of the seventh seal before the coming of the Lord. And I'll let you look at that up. But yeah, the little season after the opening of the seventh seal to prayer. prayer. We're in the little season, folks. Okay. I would like to point out that the Holy Ghost has been showing President Nelson that the coming is very near. We sustain the prophet as the mouthpiece of the Lord. He isn't teaching a specific year, but he has suggested that we are um, millennials in the true sense of the word and that we're helping each other prepare for the millennium. That is what he said. Uh, okay, uh, now, um, let's quote that. Okay, this is from uh, uh, Broadcast. I've got the link to it here. It was 2016, year 2016, in a worldwide devotional uh, called Becoming True Millennials. Okay, so here's what he said. Many people refer to you as millennials. I'll admit that when researchers refer to you by that word and describe what their studies reveal about you, your likes and dislikes, your feelings and inclinations, your strengths and weaknesses, I'm uncomfortable. There's something about the way they use the term millennial that bothers me. And frankly, I am less interested in what experts have to say about you than what the Lord has told me about you. When I pray about you and ask the Lord how he feels about you, I feel something far different from what the researchers say. Spiritual impressions I've received about you have led me to believe that the term millennial may actually be perfect for you, because, but for a much different reason than the experts may ever understand. The term millennial is perfect for you if that term reminds you of who you really are and what, you, what your purpose in life really is. A true millennial in one is one who, is taught, who was taught and did uh, and did teach the gospel of Jesus Christ pre-mortally, and who made covenants with his heavenly, with our heavenly Father. There about courageous things, even morally courageous things, that you would do while here, on earth. A true millennial is a man or a woman of uh, whom God trusted enough to send to earth during the most compelling dispensation in the history of the world of this world. They were still going on with the quote from President Nelson here. A true millennial is a man or a woman who lives now to help the people of this world, uh, prepare the people of this world for the second coming of Jesus Christ and his millennial reign. Wow, that's oddly specific. The people of this world being like the people now living. Okay, Going on with the quote, Make no mistake about it, you were born to be a true millennial. 
Expect and prepare to accomplish the impossible. God has always asked his covenant children to do difficult things. Because you are covenant-keeping sons and daughters of God, living in the latter part of these latter days, the Lord will ask you to do difficult things. You can count on it. Abrahamic tests did not stop with Abraham. Close quote. I had someone ask me what, it, what that means. Abrahamic test didn't stop with Abraham. It means it's a rough road ahead, folks. That's what it means. It means um, you need to, as Joseph Smith said, God will pull your very heartstrings. Okay? And actually, there really are such things as heartstrings. But uh, ugh, metaphorically, it's we all have to do. I, from what I understand, Joseph Smith also taught that it would be ludicrous to think that we could go and live with God, the Father and the Son, and think that, and do that without having done anything really hard. Okay? Uh, there's going to be some things, and there already have been, and perhaps there's multiple for you. So, wow. You don't get much more specific than that on the doctrine that the coming of the Lord is at hand. That's the living prophet right there, and he is telling us that it's coming. It's right. It's it's basically here. Conclusion. May we live with faith in God and not think that he delayeth his coming. The time of the second coming of Christ will be a time of great joy. The beginning of the millennium means the end of the wickedness on earth, and that our bodies will be changed to a state where they will no longer experience sickness. Knowledge from the foundation of the earth, which has been reserved for this dispensation, will culminate in the many revelations to come in the millennium. Weep for joy, the day of the Lord is at hand.